Welcome to the Tideline Compass series of conversations with leaders charting the course in impact investing. And thank you for joining us. I'm Ben Thornley, your co-host and managing partner at Tideline. Today, we're excited to be discussing the state of the impact investment market, an annual tradition here at the Compass series. We will reserve time for audience questions, so please do use the Q&A function in Zoom. But to get us started, it's a pleasure to introduce my Tideline co-host and senior advisor, Jane Bienemann. Thank you, Ben. So about a year ago, we published an article predicting that the impact investing market was close to becoming institutional. And what we meant by that specifically was that we saw the conditions forming in the impact market to support large scale participation by the biggest LPs, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, et cetera. And we made our case by rating the impact market's readiness for large scale institutional capital across five dimensions. We looked at proof of concept and we said the market was ready based on this. We pointed to the number of proven managers in the market, groups like KKR, TPG, LeapFrog, to name a few. We also looked at the depth of market or the size and breadth of product. We rated this a little below ready, due in particular to small average fund sizes that don't allow for the very large commitments that the biggest LPs need to make. We did note that more large funds were getting raised and that trend has continued. For example, we recently saw the Brookfield Global Transition Fund close at $15 billion. So now we're seeing even mega funds in the impact market, um, a sign of continued evolution in the depth of the impact market. And we considered three more criteria, data, connectivity, and awareness, each of which we also rated as a little below ready. So a year ago, we were, although a little cautious, very optimistic, that impact investing was approaching the institutional tipping point. We still are optimistic today, but uh, boy, I think it's very hard to predict the timing of that given the dynamics in the market. On the one hand, we have rising inflation, fears of recession leading to general increase in risk aversion, or, uh, general rise in risk aversion. Uh, we have backlash against ESG and impact investing. But on the other hand, we continue to see more and more interest in the space for financial reasons, for social and environmental uh, reasons. We have more transparency and consistency in the market due to consensus around voluntary standards as well as increased regulation. So there are both headwinds and tailwinds swirling around us. And I'm very glad that we have the group of experts we have with us today to help sort through all of this. So it's my uh, pleasure now to introduce our fantastic panelists. We are joined today by Alex Farmer, who heads the ESG and impact practice at Kirkland and Ellis. Kirkland is deep in the space with 20 lawyers dedicated to it and a long track record working with leading uh, impact investors. We have Dean Hand, who's chief research officer at the GIN. Dean's responsibilities include leading the GIN's pioneering work to benchmark impact performance. Justina Lai is with us. Justina is one of the industry's pioneers, having been part of the Rockefeller Foundation's leadership in creating the market. And she currently heads impact at Weatherby Asset Management. Paula Langton joins us from Campbell Lutons, a leading placement agent where Paula has established the firm as a leader in sustainability. The firm has raised 18 billion of capital for sustainability, sustainable strategies under Paula's leadership. Um, and we have Tom Mitchell with us as well. Tom is uh, from Cambridge Associates Sustainability and Impact Investing Practice. And I know is, is well recognized by many of you based on uh, his position uh, as a leading allocator in impact. So let's, um, let's get started with our discussion. Paula, I'd love to turn to you first um, and ask you what you're seeing in the market in terms of, of, of high level trends uh, and in particular, how you'd characterize institutional appetite for impact investments today. Would love to, thanks very much, Jane. So we've seen quite an evolution um, in, in allocations um, and, and positively so. So maybe a few years back, there was a general approach to, to allocations. It was, it was general 
generalist funds. And then over the years, we've seen a, a, a shift towards thematic investing. And then actually quite recently, more of a, a climate bias within those themes. Um, and we're still seeing a lot of difference between how um, investors allocate. So there are a few dedicated impact funder funds vehicles, but for the most part, people um, are, are allocating from their, from their main vehicles. And um, I would say that for those um, investors, um, they take quite a generalist approach. So in the same way, we, we, um, we call our program sustainability, which includes impact, uh, includes ESG funds linked to say credit, includes renewables funds, it, 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 it um, also funds which don't call themselves impact, which, which for all intents and purposes are um, investors take a similar approach to that um, to, to have a, as much of a catch-all as possible um, in terms of some of the funds they invest in. Um, in terms of what they're, what they're looking for, a lot of those themes have actually remained very consistently. So it's um, market rate returns they would get in their normal um, asset classes. Um, they, there's, there's often a bias towards established group. There's a bias still towards developed market strategies, but um, you know, that, that continues to, to evolve. Um, and in terms of the themes I mentioned um, as it relates to the evolution, so climate, energy transition, continues to be the biggest one, healthcare, food agriculture, um, and the rest is quite varied between financial inclusion, other social impact and others. And then in the US in particular, um, DNI uh, continues to, to, to rise um, up, the, up, the, um, up the agenda. And I would say that a few years back, we had a real um, consistent questioning with investors as to is there enough um, supply of GPs to make um, uh, sort of LPs take the time to understand the space and invest in a material way. And you know, I'm really delighted that ultimately that's that's no longer an issue for for many many um, many out there. Um, we we did uh, published a, a report earlier this year which talks about specialist um, look, just looking really at specialist climate solutions in the private markets. And the we mapped just shy of two. 200 billion worth of, um, of funds. And that's across um, private capital solutions in private equity, venture, private credit, and real assets. Um, now, no surprises, about 110 billion worth of that was in specialist energy transition, electricity type fields, um, 19 billion as in specialist food, land and ag, and 54 billion are in sector diversity of very diversified uh, climate funds. Um, and then picking up to what you said at the beginning, Jane, about uh, being, being a different different market, tough fundraising market, um, I would say that, um, yes, the backdrop is it's tough. There's lots of things investors are worried about, over allocation and the like, but from a positive perspective, um, the um, certainly the, the climate funds um, and sustainability funds in general we're working with, um, you know, we're, we're going to be having a, a first and final closing next week on an environmental fund. Um, we'll be having a, um, a, an oversubscribed fundraising and another climate fund in the next in the next few months. And, and really positively of the funds we're working on, the, those that have got sustainability and ESG, what we call plus plus characteristics are really cutting through the landscape. Great, thank you, Paul. It's wonderful to hear the momentum uh, you're seeing in the market. I'd like to um, ask Tom a question, building on uh, some of your comments around the supply side and ask you, Tom, from, from your seat, how the supply side, the depth of the market looks. Um, do you see GPs waking up to the impact opportunity and, and how does the opportunity set uh, look, look from where you, you, you see it? Thanks, Jane, and, and, and thanks, Paula, for the great comments to lead in. I mean, I think similar to Paula, we're seeing a, a rather robust market in many respects. And if I reflect back on, I've been with Cambridge for 15 years. And so while I've helped build out our sustainable impact investing practice and, and really with a big goal of how can we go find these opportunities, we've seen that opportunity set just climb, you know, the, the, the curve and the slope, upward slope of the amount of opportunities has grown year on year. Um, I, day to day, I'm thinking about my clients' portfolios and can I build a full endowment portfolio that's either all impact, all ESG aligned. I know we'll get into, there are some distinctions in this, but generally I'm looking for my clients. How can we feel aligned across the portfolio where some in, investments will have high impact, some will really reflect their values, some will help advance markets in, in different ways. And if that's entirely possible to do today. So I think we're seeing that as, you know, I work largely with institutions and a few families um, but we see as institutions and families look to uh, either outsource full solutions um, and look for that, uh, more and more people are able to do that now. 
Um, so that, that's really the good news. Um, you know, I think it's, as far as the things that short-term worry us, if we think, think what happened in the market, you know, there, there's interesting tensions in the market. I guess if I look at the supply side, I would break it down in that full endowment perspective, I guess, looking at private and public markets for a bit. So in private markets is generally where we see investments where clients can all agree and we can all agree, okay, we think we will have, you know, an identifiable impact. We have a thesis for an impact that we can have and something we can measure and track in that regard. Um, in our database in general, we, we flag managers by some broad categories. It could be from impact to ESG, broadly aligned. Um, and looking at just funds that are open right now and actively fundraising, you know, I can see over 250 funds actively fundraising right now in private markets that are self-identifying somewhat as impact. So that's um, on one hand, a healthy indicator, I suppose, but also I'm a little worried about crowding that market. We see a lot of action in the venture capital market because maybe there's lower barriers to entry um, in, in launching a fund there and at where we are in the venture cycle. I think, you know, just as important as always, that's where you have your biggest dispersion from success to failure, however you measure that from positive returns to positive impact. And if it's not a successful investment, then you're likely not having impact. So that's an interesting thing that's it's tough and where we do see people feeling over allocated. It's certainly in sustainable real assets. There's been a, there's been a great trend there. There's a lot of long-term players that have been doing good, good work. Mm -hmm. um, we think that we're really underinvested, obviously in green infrastructure and there's a lot, lot to do there. Some of the big players that are experienced infrastructure players all have some sort of sustainable infrastructure play right now. Um, interestingly, of course, you, you see former um, upstream oil and gas superstars, if you will, um, launching energy transition funds. So I think from a diligence and evaluation standpoint, uh, you know, and an authenticity standpoint, there's certainly, you know, have to question how to, can tigers change their stripes and how you look at these players coming to the markets. But there also, there's a lot to be said for credible players that know how to get expensive projects that are hard to get done on time without a lot of problems executed with a good return of capital. So um, things are turning there. I think we've long seen more in the private equity and the uh, buyout space, more of a dearth of, of impact funds. And that's been changing. You know, some of the big players mentioned, I think the big buyout funds are coming in as pensions want to come in. And I think that's, again, where Perhaps we're fortunate sometimes working with endowments and foundations. They don't all necessarily have to be universal owners. We try to think like universal owners, but don't have to buy everything. So we think about what stage we want to invest in, where we want to take risk, and we see valuation risk in the upper ends of the market. You know, that's probably also forestalled the flow of some of the capital in there. And we'll, we'll see what happens as we turn the cycle. And then on the public side, where, you know, setting aside debates on, I think all investments do have impact. Uh, there's been a lot of great investments that have tended to fall if you would categorize them more traditionally and is growth oriented investments they're really looking at good sustainable companies thinking thinking toward the long term generating new products and have high growth potential we think of older sectors that might fall more in your traditional value portfolios i think there's still some challenges in finding just managers that are thinking robustly about esg in a really thoughtful way and differentiating you know, amongst utilities, amongst cement makers, amongst even oil and gas companies in some cases, which, which ones are best positioned to do well in transition or perhaps lead transition. And I think that's, that's an area where we're really working hard to find people that we think are excellent um, in that space. So um, supply is good. Um, I think it just makes it uh, harder to, you know, it's, it's, it's great to have choices uh, for clients. So, I, you know, I think as we, as things move forward, I would just remind people, you know, there were something over 300 different clean tech managers in 2008 that we tracked um, it, just in the private markets. And, and by some estimates that whittled down to about 50 or lower um, you know, as we went through the great financial crisis. So we also wanna see in those earlier stage investors, you know, really the managers that we, our clients partner with, we really wanna make sure that they're good long-term partners and help them that they're all mutually focused on how to weather what could be challenging times perhaps in the years to come. Thank you, Tom. Really appreciate all that detail about what you're seeing and, and how it's evolved over time. Um, Justina, love to turn to you and ask you as well about um, the trends you're seeing, specifically what types of opportunities uh, your clients are seeking. And uh, I'm also curious to, to hear from you whether you're seeing uh, greater awareness or understanding of impact. So a challenge that's been identified for some time has been that folks don't understand what impact is and the ins and outs of it. So I, I'm interested as well in how you're seeing the understanding of the opportunity evolve. 
Yeah, sure. And, and thank you. Um, appreciate it. Um, you know, I think our, our clients have a wide range of interest areas. You know, our clients are high net worth individuals and families for the most part. And, you know, I would say they they have articulated all of the interests that, that Paula sort of rattled off at the very beginning. And at times they can be incredibly specific and targeted in terms of their goals. Um, but we've spent a lot of time educating our clients on the financial materiality of ESG and broader impact considerations, and also about the investment case for cross-cutting issues like climate, gender equity, and racial justice. And so, you know, I think our clients have a greater awareness of the urgency of all of these challenges. Um, and, you know, they're seeing a lot of these issues in the headlines and in the broader dialogue. Um, in terms of sort of understanding and, and clarity, I, I think we're really fortunate to have clients that trust us to help them navigate through the landscape of opportunities and really translate these challenges and the goals and, and the challenges they want to address into investment opportunities and to identify the, the ways in which their investment portfolios can actually address and contribute um, to these issues. Um, so we, we really do approach it much more holistically and we take a total portfolio approach towards incorporating impact into client portfolios. So, you know, we, we are sort of investing along that full spectrum that Tom articulated earlier. Um, you know, we're looking to develop an overarching strategy that can meet all of the goals for our clients' portfolios, financial and non-financial impact. Um, and to your point, Jane, at the beginning about a greater institutionalization, we are seeing you know, both uh, uh, increasing depth and breadth of the market that will enable us, that, that enables us to build those kinds of portfolios. Um, in general, we're really avoiding ad hoc investments. You, you know, we aren't just sort of, um, you know, picking and choosing in order to meet as client specific goals. We, we are trying to develop a holistic uh, total portfolio strategy and help articulate how each individual investment fits into and contributes to that larger strategy that we've co-developed with our clients. Um, you know, I think it's really important to educate clients about how all of these issue areas are interrelated and inextricably linked. Um, we really, uh, we guide our clients away from focusing on a single issue to the exclusion of other considerations because these, these truly are financially material and cross-cutting. Um, you know, you still need to manage ESG risks and opportunities in thematically oriented investments. Um, and so it's really our jobs to help our clients understand how their investments can contribute to their impact goals, no matter how specific they are, um, both directly and indirectly. Thank you, Justina. That's that's really um, interesting for us all to hear. Um, Dean, I'd love to turn to you now. I know at the GIN you work with both asset managers and asset owners. Would you please discuss your work with LPs in particular and what you're seeing um, in their approaches to understanding an impact investment and what they want from GPs. Yeah, so thank you, Jane. Um, and it's such a great perspective. I'm going to kind of weave in both the asset manager and the asset owner, just because they're inextricably linked. But over the past 18 months, we've been working very closely with mainly asset man asset owners. Um, these are pension funds and insurance companies that are looking to invest their assets in a way that address not only the preservation of their assets for their retirees um, and insurance clients, but in a way that adds value um, to the context in which those beneficiaries may retire to um, or be able to thrive, hopefully. Um, so there are three kind of key observations that I'll point to. Um, the one is that there is sometimes quite a lot of confusion that prevails about ESG integration and impact integration. Um, you know, sometimes the confusion points to the, the idea that perhaps they're one and the same. Um, there clearly are synergies between both, and to be clear, both are really important, and they can sit side by side. But the former is very much what we find um, people trying to grapple with is, is that the former is very much about the extent of the, of the, of the macro environment on the value of the portfolio, um, so very much inward looking. Um, Obviously, with the crisis, the climate crisis um, continually growing more dire and the extent of our social discourse, um, it's important that institutional investors and asset owners are quite right to be concerned about the influence of these macro dynamics. But impact investing strategies are really about the, the intentional target and measurement of results to change the trajectory. Um, and indeed, the system that supports that trajectory 
trajectory. I can't get the word out properly. Um, so helping to investors to actually navigate that confusion, which I think Justine, um, Justina referred to earlier, and then to determine how to engage with those strategies is absolutely key. So asset owners working with, whoopsie, that's my energy efficient light going off and I have to do this to get it going again. Um, let me do that. <laughs> there you go. So working with asset owners and asset managers to figure out what target setting looks like. Um, and when particularly the tension when asset managers would like to try and keep that investable universe broad and loose. Um, another example is how to bake um, those um, impact intentions into investor policy statements and mandates early on in the process. Um, so to avoid that kind of carve out um, mentality and thinking much more broadly about the whole portfolio. A second thing that I'll point to that we notice is that a single point of impact performance data is no longer useful to asset owners and to asset managers to understand their impact. So being able to actually compare impact performance data is crucial. And, and how I've done relative to um, how I did last year, for example, how I do relative to peers in the industry, how do I, how do I compare relative to the extent of the change that is required in order to meet the SDG target that I might be aiming for. Um, so working with context data um, to make those comparisons is absolutely key. And then finally, the final trend that I'll point to is, is that we're also seeing some very interesting work in, in different asset classes, and Tom alluded to this earlier. Um, typically public equities or listed equities, there's always been an assumption that this is an asset class that impact investors could not really deploy to use the strategy. Um, and, you know, um, if anything, they were using exclusionary or avoidance of certain stocks or proxy voting at an absolute bare minimum. But we're actually seeing an increasing number of imaginative ways um, in which asset owners and asset managers are deploying impact investing strategies in listed and public equities um, that are highly collaborative and taking engaging with asset managers and companies to a whole new level. So I'll leave it there, um, but I think those are the main trends that I can point to at this stage. Very, very helpful. Thank you, Dean. Uh, Alex, I'd like to turn to you with the topic that is on many people's minds now, regulation. and. Uh, hear your perspective on what effect the regulatory environment is having on, on the impact uh, market. Is it, is it helpful? Is it a hindrance? Um, what, uh, what, should we be, what should we be thinking about? Happy to, Jane, and thanks for having me. Um, just to lay the context, I tend to work on the GP side with private funds. My team's launch, worked on the launches of um, e Future Fund and TPG Rise and some of the other large kind of mega impact funds, as well as a, a number of either smaller or more dedicated strategies in um, areas such as racial equity, affordable housing, and, and a lot in the energy transition and climate solutions space. Um, you know, we've worked on over 50 Article 8 and Article 9 strategies, for example, under SFDR. So I think that gives us a good um, aperture of the market and uh, is the background for my, my statements here. Um, with regards to regulation, I think, unfortunately, if you looked a year back, we have more questions now than we did a year ago, which is never a good trend. Um, and, and certainly change is always difficult at first, but I, I think most managers do welcome um, some level of regulation in this space to help uh, drive their disclosures, but moderation is the key. Um, I mentioned SFDR, the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation out of Europe. Um, that's certainly been the biggest area of, of uh, work for us and, and growth over the last year. Um, we, you know, we went from a team of zero in the UK to a team of six now, um, overnight essentially. And the, the vast majority is either you know, in the fund formation or in the diligence stage for these Article 8 and 9 strategies. Um, I think, you know, I can say because I don't have to work with the EU regulators myself that um, the rollout of the SFDR uh, guidance has been horrific. Um, it seems to change every day. And I think that that uncertainty has been very frustrating for managers this year. Um, but I'm hopeful that that's going to level out and we're going to start to be able to 
um, therefore see, you know, more market trends and best practices come to light. Um, and then we have the new ESG rules from the SEC, the one that we're focused on, there's two of them, there's the names rule changes as well as the enhanced disclosure obligations for investment advisors. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the obligations are substantially less than we see under SFDR, um, but there's uh, more vagueness in terms of the categorization between uh, the three the three categories um, being ESG integrated, ESG focused, and then the subset of impact funds. So I think we need actually more clarity there um, and to better understand kind of how they line up to SFDR. So for the global managers, I think that's going to be the regulatory focus over the next year. Um, but again, as I said, I think it's helpful to have some level of, of regulation and expectations around disclosure. And that, you know, is going to apply to, I think, ESG more broadly as well than just impact. Thank you, Alex. The, that's very helpful. And the concepts of moderation and clarity certainly resonate with me. So we'll be we'll be watching for those on both sides of the, the pond. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Ben now for some additional questions for our group. Thanks, Jane. And, and Paul, I'd lo love to come back to you and um, ask specifically about the kind of playbook you use or advise your clients to use before they hit the market with a new impact fund. Like what preparation specific to an impact vehicle do you suggest for them? Thanks. So it really depends whether this is a, a brand new vehicle, um, whether it sits within a wider group uh, that hasn't really done impact before, um, or maybe it's a whole film firm built on sustainability. Um, but ultimately, either way, it's about authenticity and, and testing that first and foremost, you know, it, is, is, is management properly bought into this all? Um, um, is how, how, how is that? Um, how does that come across? How is that communicated um, and, and, and rewarded? Um, there's a lot of discussion up front that we have between you. Know, is this going to be an impact fund or uh, are not? Uh, and, and not named as such um, and and there's a lot of specifics around obviously you know not least the obvious around intentionality but also um, specifics of the pipeline the strategy the types of investors they actually want to go for um, and 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 the like um, so three examples we're working on right now so so one is um, a European um, article 9 climate fund um, that it's called an impact fund. It is impact. It, it's got it's got full um, measurement frameworks. Um, we've got another Article Nine fund that's specifically not not an impact fund. Um, but both of those, with or without it, um, uh, the, the two at the beginning that I mentioned, are oversubscribed. Um, and then we're just launching another one now, uh, which is um, which Article Eight. And this was um, a client that's very ESG leaning, but didn't want to go. Um, quite down the road with a lot of cross-sell of their existing investors. They didn't think that those existing investors would quite get the concept of, of, of impact. Um, and also they wanted to over deliver in terms of expectation around um, intentionality reporting and, and, and returns. Um, so, so everybody takes a very different approach depending on uh, the size of the fund, the LPs, um, as I say, the relevance of cross-sell um, and also the resources and um, uh, and ingredients in place to be able to manage, measure, and 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 fulfil the relevant uh, regulatory disclosures and and data needed for that. Um, perhaps it might be it might be useful because I saw, I saw a question actually in the Q and A, but it relates to actually this this playbook around um, I think emerging market fundraisings and and whether there's a tailored approach or or whether there's um, what the market is like for that. And I think what we've generally seen is um, we uh, we've taken a much more um, sort of bespoke and creative uh, uh, solutions approach to um, uh, funds in, in that area where we've had a, a potentially a, a structured uh, solution with a secondary or we've had a, um, a seeded portfolio um, or indeed we've targeted specific particular investors maybe it's corporate investor or local sovereign wealth for, for local markets um, to, to help boost the particular fundraisings and, and certainly in the um, the funds we've done in whether that was in Africa or India they've they've, um, they've certainly helped enhance um, that 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 raise mm, that's very helpful thank thanks Paula and, and um, Dean I'd love to come back to some of what Alex had mentioned about the regulatory 
environment. And I think uh, Paula touched on, on that as well in terms of the way the funds she's raising are classified against SFDR. But um, yeah, we understand that GIN sees regulation uh, as a useful tool, as a baseline, but to what extent does that leave a role still for other market standards? What are you seeing? So, um, yeah, and thank you, Ben. And, um, you know, obviously it is useful. I mean, this context of, of regulation is incredibly welcome. Um, it drives towards obviously more transparent disclosure and, the, you know, and accounting standards. Um, they're all driving towards the right investor behavior that I think is important in the market as a principle. But I suppose like rules of the road, they are the minimum that we should be able to expect from our fellow drivers. And, you know, but what we also ask for is a level of integrity to drive well with due care and with insight. So the world that we generally want, that all of us perhaps want, is to live a good life with fairness, reasonable comfort, and knowing that there is a future for ourselves and our children. Um, and that's not where the current path is actually taking us. So because investors hold such significant pools of, of assets, and I mean, some of these numbers are quite head spinning if you think about it. So, you know, the largest institutional asset owners um, in the world uh, have probably about $100 trillion worth of investment or assets, I should say, and pension funds, the, the largest, have about $6.6 .6 trillion of that. Um, I think it's important that investors actually think about how to do so much more because they can and they should. Um, uh, you know, and there are incredible tools out there to be able to actually stretch the boundaries beyond just the baseline. So, for example, Iris Plus would have good metric sets for you to be able to choose and target what it is that you actually want and to be able to measure your performance and gauge how well you're doing relative to those. The impact um, management projects help you to be able to actually understand where you want to influence and the context of your investments and the operating principles for impact management are really about trying to make sure that you follow a good set of principles that are likely determine the best impact performance results. I suppose the jury is out on whether those things should be um, regulated itself. Um, and, you know, some on this call have, have indicated, I think Jane mentioned the voluntary codes that go beyond just the, the baseline of the regulation. Um, and, you know, I think they're mixed views on whether that is actually helpful or not. But hopefully what we're actually doing is driving towards asset owners and managers that can actually do so much more with their capital than just what the baseline requires um, and, and ex it compete on the basis of impact. And some part of that um, probably is useful for it to be not regulated. Obviously, the integrity elements do, unfortunately. Hmm. Well, th yeah, thanks, Dean. And, and maybe, Alex, if I can come back to you, I'd be curious how the higher bar is being reflected in what you're seeing vis-a-vis uh, -vis other legal innovations in, in impact. I mean, are you seeing uh, a distinct set of terms, for example, carry link to impact or uh, requirements for GPs to have covenants with portfolio companies regarding impact? Would be interested if you can share any other legal innovations you've seen, Alex, that at attempt to memorialize uh, that kind of higher bar of authenticity that Dean was referring to? Sure, happy to. And I couldn't agree more with Dean. I think over the last year, what I've seen is a um, reduction in the conversations around these, you know, voluntary frameworks or, um, or initiatives and, and more of a discussion around categorization under SFDR is kind of a proxy for, for authenticity, um, which I think, you know, we need to have both um, because the regulation only can take you so far. And then I, you know, it's, it's difficult to craft the regulation um, to adequately, you know, discuss, just address these, these, processes, if you will. So the regulation really is more around, at least under SFDR, you know, is there a sustainable objective for this fund, as opposed to how is the fund um, identifying, or how is the fund identifying the um, sustainable objective for any given investment, um, and how is it 
choosing the right metrics to, to measure that progress, which is really where I think these frameworks come into play. Um, so that's just to touch on that point. But, but to the legal innovation, what we're seeing is a, a number of things. So you mentioned impact linked carry. You know, we've seen this in at least six of the larger funds um, this year. And general, and I'm gonna sort of share our, our view of the market, acknowledging that's a very small data set. And there's certainly, I mean, you, you add one more to the six, right? And so a lot of this changes, but um, what we've seen is that impact link carry or, or tying a portion of the managers carried interest to the achievement of their impact goals um, has become increasingly pre prevalent as one of the tools to ensure that the manager is going to be incentivized to achieve their impact. Um, it generally has ranged from 10 to 50% of the total carry that the manager would expect to receive um, with 10 or 25% being more frequent, um, four of the six. Um, you know, the, the structures are generally more of a penalty or a stick as opposed to a bonus or a carrot. Um, and I think that that's because uh, in, in a subset of what we've seen, these carried interest structures are actually requested by the LPs. Um, at, and, and, you know, where it's been offered by the manager um, it can be positioned as a, as a bonus or a carrot, right? But once you're already, once you've already been asked for it, it's difficult to get out of that mentality that this is just what's expected of this fund. And so it really should be a penalty for the failure to achieve these objectives. Um, also see the majority of these structures allowing for proportional or at least like step up threshold um, achievement of the impact um, carry as, you know, towards the what is intended to be a very ambitious goal for the, the, the impact um, target. And then I'd say, you know, another area of differentiation is whether the um, carry that's not achieved by the GP should go to the LP or if it should go to a charity that's sort of aligned with the intended impact of the fund. And, you know, the charity um, election has its own complications, but it um, at least reduces the friction between the LPs and the GPs, you know, to some extent of, um, if, if it were the case that just one of the two would get, would get the additional carry. Um, so that charity can reduce that friction. And then finally, um, you know, about half of them have been set around um, fund wide metrics. That's a lot easier to draft these structures around as, and for, for LPs to get comfortable with then just leaving this to be decided, you know, with, in, with KPIs and targets that are defined for each individual investment, which leaves a lot more discretion typically um, to the GP. So that's the, what we're seeing in the impact link carry market. The other areas where we're seeing legal innovation um, is increasingly in the use of certified B Corps to um, sort of memorialize the environmental or social um, goals and purpose of that company. Um, also to enable, uh, you know, the impact to continue after the GP's exit. We're also seeing enhanced data access rights being negotiated in LLC agreements or management rights letters. And that's um, not only for, you know, the regulatory needs of the Article 8 or 9 um, data that the manager is going to need to report on if it's subject to that, but also, um, you know, the the impact KPI metrics needs. So drafting around enhanced data access rights there. And one other area is in discussions around whether or not to memorialize expectations around verification and assurance. Got it, got it. Well, that's so much detail in those comments, Alex. We really, really appreciate it. Very concrete. Um, Justino, I wanna to pivot to uh, what we're seeing within the advisory industry, because obviously there's been some movement in that market in the last year, including some developments at Weatherby. Um, we'd love to hear more about what you're, what you're seeing there and what those kinds of developments, and perhaps you can share the, uh, the news from Weatherby, what that means for the evolution of the market, particularly vis-a-vis -vis specialists like Weatherby that are really well known for your impact expertise. Sure. Thanks, Ben. And for those who aren't aware, uh, Weatherby did merge with Laird Norton Wealth Management um, at the end of last year, um, creating a, a firm with a combined 15 billion in assets under management um, with four offices across the U.S. I'm actually in our Seattle office now. This is 
my office in San Francisco is not this clean. <laughs> but I, I think, you know, there's been a lot of movement, as you noted, uh, Ben, in the market. You know, several of our peers have also merged um, along with um, others who have taken private equity capital. And I think it's really, um, you know, indicative of the ongoing maturation of the impact investing market. Um, we all know that when imprint capital was acquired in 2015 by Goldman Sachs, that was sort of a, a high watermark of, of the uh, first indication of the mainstreaming of impact investing. And this is sort of a, an ongoing indication of that. And the recognition by, um, you know, other RIAs as well as um, private equity that there's real differentiation and competitive advantage uh, for those who have an expertise in this area. Um, and I think, you know, these more recent transactions are a further indication that that firms recognize that this isn't just a, you know, a service offering that you can just tack on or a, a siloed side project, um, you know, building an impact effort really requires true intentionality, um, expertise and dedicated resources, you know, to the to the point of my fellow panelists here, you know, a team that can actually discern authenticity and effectiveness of impact strategies. Um, they really go beyond just sort of offering ad hoc investments on a platform. So, um, you know, I think I think the other piece of this is about adopting principles of full organizational alignment and creating shared stakeholder value. That that sort of mindset and orientation, um, you know, it, it really can't just be an ad hoc offering. Clients are looking for alignment and and how impact is embedded into how their advisors run their own businesses. So, you know, Alex mentioned certified B Corps. Uh, Weatherby is a certified B Corporation, we were legally required to consider broader stakeholder value in, um, you know, our, in our M&A decisions. Um, and we do believe this combination is better for clients, employees, the broader community and environment. And it's really an opportunity to bring greater awareness and more education to an existing client base and, and ultimately leverage more capital for impact. Got it. Got it. Thank, thanks, Justina. And, and Tom, um, before we go to the audience, uh, questions, a, a final question for you. I think, you know, Paula had spoken about one of the first steps in her own work being to kind of navigate how to label a fund, how to classify it, what to what to call it. And we imagine with a large universe of, of products coming to market that you're seeing that you have that same kind of conversation with your, your clients. So would love to ask how you distinguish you know, impact investments from other types of sustainable investments? Um, how do you discern what it is that your clients want? And are you relying on the managers and the labels they're bringing to you? Or are you having to, you know, work with your clients to classify what you think a, a fund is really trying to accomplish? Thanks, Ben. I mean, I, I feel that that question or some form of that's always been the critical question, always when we work with clients. So I, I first start by just throwing the broad statement that you know, many years ago, uh, Clara Miller, when she was president of the Heron Foundation said that all investments have impact, um, but, but most investors are, are completely unaware of what sort of impact that investment might be having. So I think at a fundamental level, this sort of, that reinforces the idea of know what you own and really you know, kind of, we do try to create a, a view and help our clients create a view of what, what do you own today as particularly if we think we're gonna transition a portfolio, if we're starting a new, uh, to move to something that's more aligned or impactful. Um, I, you know, the, I think the other things that have changed since Clara made that statement and since I joined Cambridge 15 years ago, when we first started talking with clients about impact investments or mission investments, that, you know, the role of the advisor was very much in focus because everyone felt like if we can fix the advisors, we'll fix, we'll fix the problem. And then impact investments will flow. And so the role of the advisor, the allocator, the OCIO is critical in, in that relationship they build with the clients and, and, and really the communication. Uh, but ultimately, the, the impact is in the eye of the beholder. Here at Cambridge, where we are now, uh, is this broad, firm-wide belief in the materiality of sustainability. So climate change is real. Climate risk is real. Uh, we need solutions and we need adaptation, frankly. And it's going to affect every portfolio, everyone's portfolio assets, whether you're focused on climate change as a priority or not. So how do we address that, right? And so that supports a broader understanding of ESG qualities. Um, so across any manager we look at, we wanna assess them for ESG. And I think that's our own internal process of making sure everyone understands how to engage on that level, right? And to have those conversations from a diligence standpoint and how do we capture that 
and translate it. So I think that's, I hate to use the word table stakes. It's the casino analogy and things like that, but there is sort of a, a, a bare minimum now that people have to be prepared to speak to ESG. They also have to be able, particularly here in the US, be able to speak to how they think about equity and inclusion across their firms. And is another dimension of just diligence. But impact, I think, you know, I go back to even, you know, we had debates going back many years of what is an impact investment not. And really the gin was very helpful and guidance all along in that. And really talk about intentionality. So if we, if we think about, you know, is, is a manager or bringing forth a strategy that has an impact intentionality to it. Um, sometimes we've met managers who won't label that as an impact intentionality. And sometimes there's real fears of how they market themselves. And, and in different markets, impact investing is received differently overseas than it is here in the U.S. Um, but if we can help them identify look, if that's high impact and something we can capture, then, you know, I think that's sort of a general description where we see, you know, this could be an impact investment. Um, and then when I talk about the importance of clients, you know, there's a spectrum of capitals. Um, what's the highest and best use of your capital? We're working with foundations, or you know, your grant capital is, that's the capital that will never be returned, right? So might you have your highest impact there? Can that capital go to work to fix something that the, cap the capital markets can't otherwise do? Where we cross those lines or blur those lines, if you will, would be, say, the program-related investment uh, area. And, you know, I'm, I'm I work with a lot of great clients. I'm proud to work with the Cerdna Foundation. I think I have uh, one of my partners, I think Adam Conacher could be on the call today. And, and you know, in working with Cerdna on building out their impact portfolio, they've taken, they've really helped shape my thinking and change my thinking on PRIs. It's not just providing affordable capital, perhaps some of the initial PRIs I saw to social enterprises, but saying like, is this an area where we should be seeking our highest impact and taking our highest risk? So therefore you can take equity oriented risk, but it's in perhaps an unproven market or enterprise. You know, you're trying to prove something new and different. So you recognize there could be some loss or risk of failure that you might not otherwise be taking in a more proven market. Um, and, I, and I wanna differentiate that between sort of IRS definitions of PRI and, and MRI, but I think it's, it's a good way to think about pursuing risk and impact um, there. So um, ultimately, you know, I think a good advisor has to be able to engage across, understand that spectrum and engage with their client and understand where their highest priorities are. I think the final thing I'll say, because I know we've one time for questions is, you know, over the years, there's been the question of, well, can we measure it? What will we measure? You know, from my perspective and our perspective, if you can have a clear thesis of what the impact may be an agreement, with your client and the manager on what will be provided from a measurement standpoint or what you will be asking for over time, that's good enough to go forward and track and measure that. You don't wanna wait for absolute certainty in a complex system just in order for you to make a good investment. And so, you know, we wanna help learn, you know, alongside with our partners on the GP side, the manager side and with the clients on what impacts we're really generating. Got it, got it. Thanks, Tom. And I'll turn it over to Jane to uh, to introduce some questions from the audience. Great. Well, let's um, let's get to the questions. We've we've got an interesting question, I think, about disclosure and labels, um, and specifically that the SEC has proposed the ESG practices disclosure regulation, which um, divides between ESG integration and ESG focus, with impact proposed to be a subset of ESG focus. The question is, is this a, a good way to define impact and um, will it uh, help advance or inhibit impact investing, putting impact under ESG focus from a disclosure? So um, I'd be interested in all of your perspectives on that, but is there anyone who would? Um, Justine, it looked like you might have had a, a thought. Um, I, I do think we need folks to sort of weigh in on this. I, 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 I struggle a little bit with this because I, I think uh, if it's not a core part of your investment decision making process, if it's not part of if it's if it's not driving a fundamental investment thesis and is not driving fundamental investment decision making, then it's just a consideration. Um, you know, I think it runs the risk of confusing the issue more. Um, and so I, I'm not concerned for folks who um, do this work on a daily basis and aren't sort of um, making any investment decisions based solely on the label of a product. You know, I, I think Tom mentioned that, and, you know, we conduct the same level of sort of due diligence across all of our strategies. But I am concerned about those who, um, you know, 
don't have the capacity or the time to sort of conduct that work themselves. So I think uh, I think it, that label can be incredibly confusing. I think the actual disclosure of it is a very positive thing um, because investors do have the need for better and more detailed information regarding a given fund's sustainable approach. But uh, again, the, the danger is more in sort of the labeling aspect of this. Um, but I've also, you know, uh, to be frank, I've not delved deeply into the rules themselves, but my understanding is also it may not be, there may be a misunderstanding also that it may not say it's ESG and integration, it may just be integration, which confuses the issue even further. So I think there's clearly some need for clarity. Yeah, I'm happy to build on that. And just, just to, um, what Justina was talking about was, it, it is right, it's integration funds. And it's to be an integration fund it's that you have considered ESG factors, but given them no greater weight than non ESG factors, it's hard to um, imagine a world where this box isn't at least checked, right? There, technically, you can check none of these boxes. But who's going to say we didn't consider governance? Like, who's going to say we didn't consider some level of mater material, environmental, or social risk? You know, um, so we're really living in a world where at least one of these boxes is going to be checked. And so the bar for integration funds is very, very low, in my opinion. Um, and needs to that needs to be differentiated. Like, is it is it really the case that um, you know traditional legal or business diligence is enough to start it to be considered an integration fund? And then when you look at ESG focused and the subset within that of impact focus, I agree that is not going to help um, better distinguish kind of um, ESG versus impact. Um, and I think that there's a lot of questions with regard to the impact fund. As I mentioned earlier, the definition is, is very broad. It's any fund that seeks to achieve a particular ESG impact or impacts that generate specific ESG related benefits. Um, that, is, that does not mean necessarily that the uh, objective of the investment has to be, um, you know, uh, it has to be an environmental or social or sustainability impact, like we see with SFDR Article 9, right? It's a much lower bar. When you actually kind of dig into the SEC's comments about this, they do start to differentiate between financial objectives and, you know, impact objectives, which I think is helpful, but that's not integrated into the definition. So I would encourage anybody in the impact community to really think about how could SEC you know, define impact funds better to retain the authenticity of that term um, and provide comments to the SEC um, before I think it's, uh, I think it's like August 17th or something. Don't count, don't, don't, um, you know, keep me to that. Look it up yourself. Well, thank you, Justine and Alex. And I think the work we're all doing around education and awareness um, that, that the need for that will continue for some time, regardless of these. I, on that note, I guess I do see a question um, coming out about um, um, you know, the perception that impact investments are concessionary or below market return. And I'd be very curious, Paula, to hear from you um, as, a, as a mainstream um, actor, whether that, that, that is still a, a perception that you're, that you're dealing with on both the, the GP and the LP side and how you navigate that. I would say that that reared its head more, um, say, three or four years ago in terms of conversations. Um, I think there's a much more broader acceptance now that um, you know this is this is this is mainstream. You can get the same rates. Um, I think that we, um, you know, the, the conversation comes up every now and again uh, in different ways. Um, and the way it probably does come up more recently is that. Um, and I know I keep harping on about climate. I know there's been some questions about the social impact side of things, but um, the, the climate solutions often um, sit alongside a number of different asset classes, more so than other particular areas. And therefore, the, the subject of well, do, what does that do to the return threshold is a little bit more. So if we think about innovations in, say, natural capital, um, in agriculture and the like, you know, that's when the conversation comes up a little bit more um, around you know, what's the respect of return and, and does that mean that, that we're looking for something a little bit different? Um, I think it also comes up a little bit in, to tie in with what Alexandra was saying earlier about impact link carry. Um, and, you know, if you if you have that impact link carry, does it therefore mean that impact is ahead of um, financial returns in, in, um, in the GP's minds? And then it opens a debate in, in, in that regard. But I would say for the most part, um, it's quite well, it's quite well understood now, thankfully. 
I have a different view from the U.S. side. I think the debate is is live and well. Um, and and what we've seen from Texas and West Virginia and um, other politician statements around ESG is only stoking that debate. What is going to to help push us forward is greater rigor around you know studies involving value creation. Um, I think we all need to challenge ourselves in the impact market as a whole to, to continue to keep a focus on value creation and data showing that there are, you know, equal to or greater than returns, um, because otherwise, you know, there will continue to be challenges on the fiduciary duties. I mean, we just saw the Department of Labor rule rolled back in the last year or two, like we were living in a world before that, where, you know, um, the consideration of ESG was prohibited for ERISA fiduciaries. So I think that we could easily go back to that in the U.S. if there's a change in administration and, and, and how we're going to, you know, push through that is around, is with data. Right. Thank, thanks, Alex. I think in these final few minutes, um, we'll do a lightning round of questions to, uh, to end our discussion today. And so I'm going to go around the group with the same question of, you know, what is the trend you're seeing that you believe will help most accelerate growth and how will we know we're seeing that trend? So this is in, in 45 seconds or less, uh, Paula, starting with you. I think uh, as investors develop net zero strategies within within their um, their groups, I think there'll be a greater shift in allocation towards um, more sustainability and impact products. Um, and whilst the first port of call for those um, allocations will be driven by by climate, I think it would help um, have the follow on effect with social impact as well as you get more mainstream investors familiar with the the language and the and the area and the space. I mean, ultimately, it's how we move the U.S. demand in a more meaningful way, which uh, is a whole other other area of debate. Great. J Justina? Yeah, I'm going to maybe cop out a little bit. I think this is, I mean, there's over 200 participants on this call. I think it's it's incumbent upon all of us. I think it's naturally going to happen because of the challenges that we face. And those challenges give rise to really attractive investment opportunities. Tom mentioned Claire Miller's statement around, you know, all investments have impact positive, negative, neutral. And it's really about how do we internalize the, those externalities? How do we you know, identify investments that maximize and monetize the positive externalities being created by investments? And how do we minimize and mitigate the negative externalities? And that's going to happen through investments as well as policy. So um, right. I'm very hopeful. Thanks, Justina. Tom? You know, I really echo exactly what Paula said on net zero. It's been taking a lot of my time as we've made our own net zero commitment here at Cambridge, but thinking about how that affects not only advice to all portfolios, but questions that were hosted in there about you know measurement frameworks. I think like the OPA convergence project is something that's interesting, like things that where people don't have to come up with their own method, but what can we all agree on? You know, GPs need to be providing with respect to climate. And then it's absolutely critical that it's a just transition. Right. And that, you know, climate can be well articulated, but th there's been a big gap between equity inclusion and climate investing. And I think the last few years have helped close that gap as people's awareness has increased around equity inclusion. But I'm um, continuing to drive that and not just thinking of diversity for diversity's sake, but where we're actually creating just and innovative solutions um, in all communities will be a uh, continued guiding light for all. Great. Thank thanks, Tom. Alex, to you. And then we'll give Dean the final word. I agree with everything that's been said and would say, you know, further um, fund specific uh, portfolio emissions, specifically that are PCAF aligned reporting, I think will really drive a change in um, energy transition fund allocations. Great. Thanks, Alex. And Dean? Um, thanks, Ben. Uh, I, you know, I'm very optimistic. I mean, sure, there are headwinds if you want to just pick out isolated examples of where things are maybe difficult. But I just see an enormous amount of enthusiasm and deep thought from very key actors. There are increasing number of actors in the field that are figuring out very difficult questions. Um, and we're seeing things like benchmarks, validation and reporting, um, particularly coalescence around how to do this. Um, there's a movement. It's I think reached much more than a tipping point if it wasn't a while ago already. Um, and the key challenge really is about how to fi figuring out how to do it exceptionally well. And I think that's really the, the challenge going forward. But I think that there's a huge movement that is already well underway. Thanks. Well, thank, thank you, Dean. And thank you so much to all of our panelists and to you all in the audience for, for tuning in. Please join us for the next Compass series 
event in September. Uh, and in the meantime, please do visit tightline.com and, and thank you. And we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. So bye for now. And thanks again to our panelists for a great session.